class reunion, Everdale, a 30-year-old experiment in education, gets a report card on Man Alive. It was part of the culture there that it was really cool to be hung up. Just being upset was never good enough. You were really forced to spill your guts. We talk about the 60s and, you know, the love and the this. Well, it wasn't like that, you know? often think that by recognizing the obsessions of a past era, we see better the obsessions of our own era. Hello, I'm R.H. Thompson, and welcome to Man Alive. Tonight we follow Naomi McCormick back in time as she revisits her teenage memories and her idealism. Naomi went to school here in 1968. This was Everdale, an experimental school. Here staff and students engaged themselves in radical new directions. You remember the 60s? Anti-war marches, free love, LSD. The obsession was to question every limit and structure in sight. Social limits, psychological limits, moral limits, educational limits. Everdale championed process. Process was thought to be more important than the result. This is an old idea. And this school championed Naomi's process of opening herself to learning and to her life. So was it worth it? And did Everdale's idealism prepare her for what was to come? Education certainly has been wrenched in the opposite direction. Our leaders now tell us education should be run like a business. It must serve its clients. Graduates must be made more marketable. In other words, the result is now more important than the process. The exact reverse of Naomi's Everdale. What can I say? Obsessive, eh? In the summer of 1995, I discovered a box of old books, letters, and diaries, all dating from the years I spent as a teenager at the Everdale Place, a free school community. I had come to Everdale in 1968, a curious 13-year-old with big ambitions, eager to be part of this utopian experiment in communal living and radical education. We're going home for the second time. Located on a 100-acre farm near the town of Hillsburg, Ontario, Everdale was home for a handful of idealistic educators and wayward students. Kids like myself, too restless or rebellious for conventional schooling. Everdale was where I studied Marx and Marcuse, where I lost my virginity and learned how to butcher a cow, where I gave up my childish dream of becoming prime minister and began to see myself as a cog in the wheel of the coming revolution. My Everdale experience profoundly influenced my next 25 years, a quarter of a century in which I'd never looked back until I found my diary. October 4th, 1968. I've been at Everdale a month now. I have a crush. I can't stop thinking about him. The way he rolls a cigarette and strikes a match against his jeans. I wonder how his lips taste. I wonder if he's done it. to my first love, what had happened to all of us, and if any of us still lived by Everdalian ideals. Finding those diaries stirred up strange doubts. Was I a lucky participant in a free school nirvana, or a guinea pig in a cultish ideological experiment? Everdale, what was it really all about? started Everdale was a school where we as staff would be able to teach what we wanted to teach in a way we wanted to teach and the kids coming in would be able to learn in a, a, fashion, a fashion that was much more democratic. That it was a time of very intense experiment in everything uh, and so we were part of that experiment that says you have to go back and start over and live simply and um, share decision-making 
but uh, you have to step apart from the world in some way to do this properly. Really, I wanted to be a kind of a Moses to lead uh, all the oppressed people out of, the, out of Egypt through the desert to the promised land. The staff had their visions. We kids had ours. You know, when I saw the brochure um, and heard the description, I thought, wow, this is going to be kind of like a summer camp type of situation where you're living with other people who are your age and, and you know, it seemed like a fun kind of thing. It was on a farm and it had horses, you know, and the 13-year-old in me sort of <laughs> heard that and that's, that's what appealed to me. I mean, it was going to be on a farm and there was going to be horses. I went up for the interview and the interview itself uh, was wonderful. I stayed there for three days. Uh, we had a huge water fight and I was part of the water fight and I felt part of this group of people. And I just, I sort of felt, sort of, I came to life. School wasn't uh, very successful for me, so uh, a social worker found this venue and thought it would be a good alternative. So that's how I arrived at Everdale. And, uh, I mean, for me it was a free school. It was a teenage Shangri-La. My first trip back was full of trepidation. Well, I didn't remember the place being a Shangri-La. It had been over two decades since it ceased operations as a school. A feeling of dread descended upon me. The big room where we ate all our meals and spent hours arguing about the smallest issue was empty. Hollowness echoing the hundred ghosts. Standing there, I found myself seized with a desire to see everybody again, even the people I couldn't stand. As conventional high schools had their reunions, why not Everdale? Eighteen months and many phone calls later, almost sixty of the students, staff, and hangers-on who called Everdale home have made it back. I wonder what everyone's looking forward to this weekend. Is it the pleasure of seeing childhood friends? Or something more, like a yearning for that old idealism, that golden worldview of the 60s? Or do we just want to party? In the afternoon, Bob rounds us up for the film screening. I head down to the barn to set up the projector. First stop is Don Chabib's 1966 documentary. I, I want to see kids come to this school and in the course of their time here find out what they are capable of doing to discover what talents they really have. Now, to do this, we want to lay on at the school as many things as possible in the line of arts, music, crafts, agricultural work, outside activities of various sorts, as well as the regular academic work. And in the course of time, students will try all these things, I hope, find out what they like to do, what they can do, and get some clear idea of what they ultimately want to do with their lives. The reality was that the kids didn't much want to talk to the adult group, they wanted to talk to each other. And so they would stay up all night talking. And uh, when morning came and we were all ready to go and educate them, they were all sleeping and didn't want to get up and didn't feel obliged to get up. So we had conflict right there. 
because we felt a certain responsibility, particularly as we had some younger kids, we felt the need that, uh, for them to reflect on what they were doing by not participating in the process. And this ultimately became the nub of the final fight, the final showdown. And it was really, in the end, a battle between process and performance. People who believed we should be doing things, and people who felt that to reflect and to talk about things was the process, was the important process. It was definitely one of the uh, approaches that I brought to the school, was that uh, it's a good thing to be able to talk about how you're feeling about things, and uh, endlessly. <laughs> That's one thing we still do well. The next morning, we gather under the tent canopy to reminisce. Having taught high school in rural Manitoba for five or six years, we, Jim and I, joined Bob Davis and Al Rimmer, the founders of Everdale, to start an alternate school based on the teachings of um, A.S. Neal, if you like, in Summerhill. Now, coming as teachers with an academic background, you have to admit we were sort of shocked out of our skulls to find out that we were sitting in an empty classroom and kids might pass by and say, Hi, Ruth, see you at lunch. <laughs> if you came to teach within the walls of a classroom, forget it. You would have packed up and gone home. And so the definition of a school community, to me, took on the focus of a community. It was like a education in different ways of thinking and different lifestyles. And for me, that was great to just... Uh, you know, just really, I'd be into flower here. And uh, living in community, you know, and having all these close friends. I remember walking around. I, I didn't understand what love was, you know. And I would say, do you really love me? You know, <laughs> and uh, there were, like, everyone was so affectionate and warm and hugging each other all the time. And uh, just getting that sense, you know, that sense of security that people really cared and developing that. I, I really developed that here. And then, like, you know, our friendship. Johnny and me, you know, like we were from opposite ends of the spectrum, but we were so close, and it just opened me up to a different, like, the people can come from a totally different background than you, and you can still really love each other, you know? That was very special. Heather and I were best friends, and milking buddies. Sunday, November 23rd, 1968. Poppy had her calf today. It kept coming out part way and then sliding back in. Wet ankles with soft, jelly-like hues. Finally, after what seemed like hours, we took a hold of those ankles and pulled with all our might, and the calf came tumbling out. We nearly cried, we were so happy. We call the calf cocaine. One of the wonderful things about Everdale was that academics and milking cows and learning how to live in a community were put on an equal par and I certainly went for a lot of those other things. Um, all of which worked for me because of my background. I think now as an adult looking back and as a teacher looking back that there should have been more structure. It was like saying you don't have to go to school, you don't have to go to classes and I found it very, very difficult to find any part of me that would wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to class, I'm going to learn. I think that I remember all the things that happened to me academically because they, there were so few of them. So they really stand out. And, uh, and the ones that stand out were wonderful. And the whole rest is sort of a blur of staying up late, sleeping in, and uh, endless meetings. The general arrival is just like eating in uh, Union Station, you know, while the, the train's discharging in the restaurant. Yeah, that's about what it's like. Yeah, yeah that, that's one reason I've got these candles out, you know, mainly it's a small thing, but it's to try and cut down the spitting of meals at a time when you open the cavity and pour in the stuff. <laughs> On, you know, what, what has happened to the old, the old idea of a feast? It's like it's not literally a feast. Well, this time, you know? your, your idea of a feast is ridiculous. Right. You think of this bunch of Queen Elizabeth sitting around at a table <laughs> with linen and fine turkey. Yeah. Well, my idea of a feast is nothing like that. It's a bunch of Vikings sitting around a wood table. <laughs> and a bunch of horns full of beer. The meetings were tedious, boring 
agonizing, you know, smoke-filled. But, you know, you had to work it out. Even though the same meal, dressed up differently, kept coming back over and over and over again. Conflict just was stretched out and just bled to death. September 18th, 1968. Tonight was my first meeting. It was amazing. All the kids were really honest with what they were feeling. Nobody was afraid to show their emotions. The staff kind of prodded them to do it. Two of the guys broke down and started crying. I found it terrifying. It'll take me a while before I can do that. February 29th, 1969. Today at the meeting, one of the new guys asked if he could have a door put on his room. He's a cool guy, but the staff don't like him because he doesn't go to class. Anyone else would have got the door. All he got was sarcasm. His face got really red and he couldn't say anything. I felt bad for him. All he wanted was a little privacy, but they reduced him to a pile of shit. Just being upset was never good enough. You were really forced to spill your guts. And, and I found it very uncomfortable and very strange. Uh, at that age, you know, I think most teenagers want to keep things inside. It's, you know, part of that whole time that you're exploring yourself, never mind, you know, the rest of the, the world around you. And I found it very uh, one-sided in that respect. And, and people might not agree with me, but I used to find that some of the adult members really enjoyed it. You know, I feel so ambivalent about Everdale. On the one hand, it was maybe one of the first times in my life that I really felt at home and felt comfortable much of the time. On the other hand, it was a time of my life where I felt really deeply depressed a lot. Now, it's difficult to even understand it myself. Um, I think uh, partly it, it, it was, it, you know, it was part of the culture there that it was really cool to be hung up and depressed, you know? And, and I mean, the bigger story you had over someone else, then, then, then it made you a little more interesting. And, and I think, well, who did it make you more interesting to? Well, it made you more interesting to the staff. I felt that uh, the interest in the deeper levels of children on the part of some of the staff was nothing short of voyeurism. It was getting into people's heads and into the, under their skin, uh, as a, a stated goal being it's in, uh, therapeutic, but to me it was manipulative and it was voyeuristic and it was cruel. And I was opposed to it totally. Um, you know, it's interesting how this question of was there enough, uh, were there enough boundaries and uh, how about personal privacy is, um, it is a very big theme for modern psychiatry. And uh, it's had a it's had a big comeback. And uh, it's true that we were set up more to uh, challenge boundaries. I think. You know, it was a fairly predatory place in a lot of respects. So it didn't. You know, it wasn't like we talked about the '60s and you know the love and the this. And the well, it wasn't like that. You know. I think if you don't let anybody get close to your to your children who are precious to you, you better find some way to screen out the kind of undesirables we were as staff. The ceremony of innocence should not be drowned. Well, the ceremony of innocence was definitely drowned here. You know, I don't think people who really knew what was happening walked away from here. I walked away myself in 1971. My own song of innocence ended. While I followed my own path, I still live in community. As for my first love, well, after 25 years, we didn't have a whole lot in common. But at least we could still share a laugh. Did I ever find the answer to my question? 
any time. Everdale for me was was about social, learning about social justice, was learning about a connection between art and politics, was learning about community and communion and spirit, and it was learning about a vision of change. And all of those pieces are with me. The Everdale experience, nobody could manipulate her after that. I mean, I would hope not, at least. I, thought, I think it toughened these kids to be tough adults, intellectually. They could have developed a real educational alternative to what was going on, and instead, I think they turned it into this quasi, you know, cultish, psychologically introspective, weird, little introverted community. Just like the old days, we lack consensus. Everdale was really good for me. When I came here, I was, uh, I came from downtown Toronto. And I was uh, a bad guy. And Everdale uh, turned me around. And uh, probably saved my life. People have asked me if I had children, would I send them here? It's a question you can't answer because it's, it's in the past. The things I learned here were so broad. Uh, I have a joke where I say the things I learned were very defined. I learned to ride motorcycles. I was a champion. I learned to take drugs. I was good at that. <laughs> but I survived all that. I learned to make love. And that's also pretty important. Learn to share love. So anybody who has scars, I can only say you would have had them anyway. The scars and the ideals that marked my Everdale years gave me the ley lines for the map that was to be my adult life. was about dreams and passion and teenage angst, cooked up with a dash of self-delusion in a big communal pot. Am I glad that I was part of the Everdale experiment? I still don't know. Am I happy that I went back? Absolutely. Obviously, I had to find some help, so I looked on the internet and found stuff that all parents need to know. Tide with bleach gets out most tough stains Amelia gets into better than the leading detergent. And it helps keep colors bright. It helps when you know what you're doing. If it's got to be clean, it's got to be Tide. You have to learn fast to survive. The news final is on at a great time for sports fans. Glenn Reed has a full wrap-up of all the day's stories in sports from across Saskatchewan and elsewhere. CBC News Final, tonight at 11.30. Friday on CBC Radio. Hi, I'm Sheila Coles, and this is a Christmas card by Saskatchewan artist Will Perot, and it could be yours if the price is right. Listen to the Morning Edition Christmas Card Auction tomorrow on CBC Radio 1. This is your TV. This is an impressive satellite dish. This is what happens when you put them together. 
All kinds of amazing channels bundled together by areas of interest. You never pay for the kinds of channels you don't want, like you do with cable. And with ExpressView's digital technology, you get picture and sound quality that's out of this world. So come on over to Better TV. ExpressView. The Cancer Society is offering you a candle to honor those living with who have beaten or who have lost the battle with cancer. Luminarians will soon be available at these businesses. Join the Cancer Society in a tribute to hope and courage. The Cancer Society is offering you a candle to honor those living with who have beaten or who have lost the battle with cancer. Luminarians will soon be available at these businesses. Join the Cancer Society in a tribute to hope and courage. Ambassador of Peace. But 25 years ago, she was the little girl in the picture, symbolizing the horror of the Vietnam War. Kim's story, The Road from Vietnam, tonight at 8 on Witness. I was able to get out of my wheelchair and walk. New treatment for sufferers of multiple sclerosis. It's been very exciting in the whole field of MS because it does appear to alter the underlying disease. The Health Show, next. in a tribute to hope and courage. Ground Rules, every Friday on the CBC NewsHour. To help with your Christmas shopping this Saturday and Sunday, almost anything you can cram into this Eaton's bag is 25% off the regular price. Designer fashion, accessories, pots and pans, shoes and pillows. If it fits in this bag, it's 25% off. And if it doesn't fit, it's 15% off. No! Merry Christmas from Eaton. How can you give someone a taste of something this refreshing, this cool, this holiday season? Give a Brita water filter system. It's a really cool gift. Stop ignoring me! Those engineers put me here because you need Jet Dry in your rinse cycle. Give me some Jet Dry. Let me fight that residue. Hallelujah! <laughs> <laughs> Look at that! Brilliant! Jet Dry. Mwah. Your dishwasher was designed for it. There's something exciting happening at Safeway. A chance for you to win prizes like... Samsung's 25-inch TV VCR combo. Cookware and appliances from Tefal. The Samsonite Easy Cart. $300 in Visa Traveler's Checks from Scotiabank. Or a trip for two to Puerto Vallarta, courtesy of World of Vacations Canada's number one tour operator to the sun. Hockey Heroes participating products. Orville Redenbacher Microwave Popping Corn. McCain Pizza Pocket. 
Score with incredible savings in this one's Safeway Coupon Book. Hockey Heroes at Safeway Food and Drugs. CBC News Final, tonight at 11.30.